Today's movie gleefully rips off like 10 better films, but hey, it's got a grown man running around in dinosaur PJs. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Ruben Galindo Jr.'s weirdly entertaining splatter flick, Don't Panic. Released in 1987, Don't Panic is a hodgepodge of ideas from other better movies. It's got little nods to A Nightmare on Elm Street, a bunch of demonic possession films, and Witchboard. It winds up being its own film, for better and for worse. It's not as good as any of its myriad inspirations, but it has become something of a minor cult classic like the rest of Galindo Jr.'s filmography. But enough about that. Can Don't Panic summon up five barf bags of blood? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons Mr. Meat Hook, go check out his channel, Brick Ryu, and Larry Derringe. Hope I didn't butcher your name, Larry. If you'd like to sponsor some videos and free me from YouTube's tyranny, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the pinned comment and description below. And now, let's get bloody. Dynamic films, eh? I don't know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Ah, our first Ruben Galindo Jr. film, and probably not our last. Jam Michael Vincent? Awesome! Oh wait, John Michael Bischoff. I feel like this movie is going to be an imitation everything. Bischoff also sang the amazing theme song. We then join the movie proper. It looks like Budget William Cat was attacked by an at-home perm kit. Is this your first birthday in Mexico? Yeah. You'll get used to it. He'll get used to his first birthday in Mexico? Um, okay. Back inside, Michael surveys the wreckage from his party. Clearly, Mom didn't get the memo that the party's over, though, because she's still boozing it up. He's about to call it a night, but it sounds like the house has indigestion. Poor IBS. He heads back downstairs and walks right into the movie's first jump scare. But it turns out it was just a prank. Is this how they celebrate birthdays in Mexico City? Sweet, they brought him presents for the after party. And it looks like they brought him a friend. You remember Alex? She's the girl I was telling you about. I wonder if she charges by the hour or by the eyebrow. Upstairs, Mom's like, Oh, vodka, you're the only one who understands me. Good night. I guess they don't get J&B in Mexico. Back downstairs, it turns out they just brought him a Ouija board. Here's to hoping they summon Captain Howdy, or even Tawny Katane. Oh man, not another Ouija board. I got a closet full of these things. Michael finally agrees to play, but it's mostly because we need an inciting incident. But when nothing happens, his best bud decides to do a little acting. Shut up, everybody! Wait! Wait! Man, this guy is desperate to summon some demons. Five false stars later, is something finally gonna happen? <laughs> no, just more pranks. Look, movie, if you're not gonna take yourself seriously, neither will I. But before they can awaken their local poltergeist, Mom ruins the fun. Okay, that's it. Everybody out. It's probably best for Michael. He seems like too much of a dweeb to be a demon host. And house establishing shot. You know, just in case you forgot, they were in a house. Back inside, the movie decides to start itself. If you guessed that planchette was gonna move, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. I like that it's basically dancing to the soundtrack. The next day, Michael tries to sneak in the back door. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, not like that, you pervs. I mean, he's trying to sneak into class. But before he gets in, he runs across old unibrow herself, Alex. Man, these two are gonna have some awkward kids together. His perm mullet and her Frida Kahlo eyebrows. Ugh. I don't think they're gonna let me in my class either, but would you like to have breakfast with me? Then they sneak off for breakfast. This is the worst Metal Gear stealth mission ever. 13 minutes into the film and we're already enjoying a montage. Here we see Michael buy some balloons while unpaid extras check out his sweet perm mullet. Later they release the balloons. <laughs> Look at this doofus's face. It's like he just discovered gravity. Then they stop for ice cream. <laughs> yeah, sure, just take your time, movie. I mean, I've got nothing better to do today. And after what feels like a six hour montage, Michael doesn't even score. <laughs> what a loser. I had a great time, huh? Me too. Bye. Over at his Ouija buddy's house, he gets a magic rose. As long as love exists between you two, the rose will never wither. Um, isn't that the plot of Beauty and the Beast? I can't even with this movie right now. Then we jump to another house establishing shot. You know what to do. Michael's having a dream. And after that montage and with all this glistening, I probably don't need to tell you what kind of dream. Football practice. Wait, is it soccer practice because this was made in Mexico? He seems shocked to wake up all wet. 
Don't worry, Michael, it's totally normal for boys. And now he's got Murder Cam. That's the nerdy guy from Ouija Night getting whacked. Whoa, 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 is he wearing dinosaur pajamas? What is he, six? The next day, Michael goes to give Alex the magic rose, but he finds out she's two-timing him with the bad guy from every 80s sex comedy ever. Look, you know he's a bad guy. The sweater and loafers totally give it away. Instead of giving in to Captain Howdy, he lets Alex justify her cheating ways. Maybe this is like a John Cassavetes movie where the real terror is found in the subtext. Her unibrow stands for plurality and intimacy. I love you. Okay, stage five clinger alert. Get out now, Mike. But instead of making his escape, Michael invites her back to his place for some more dialogue. <laughs> Man, this music is like an after-school special. Is Michael gonna end up pregnant or OD on no-dos or what? Oh god, he's gonna show her little Mikey. I really don't need to see this. And after thoroughly embarrassing himself in bed, Michael lays as still as possible hoping that Alex will forget he's there. Later that night, right before bedtime, his pink eye returns. Who dies this time? No, not Debbie. Wait, which one was Debbie? Michael's new Ouija power is being able to see people get murdered. Seems pretty cool, much better than watching people go to the bathroom, I guess. Wait, is Michael about to go to the bathroom? While Mike's busy crawling around his carpeted bathroom, our victim takes one to the dome. Mom's like, Michael, I know what you're doing in there. I wash your PJs and change your bed sheets. You'll go blind, sinner. The next morning, Corey Hart here does his best to hide his severe case of IVD while his mom goes all karate kid on him. Don't tell me you're going to wear those glasses to school. Aren't you gonna take them off? Then this happens. Michael. Yeah, I guess we might as well rip off Videodrome while we're here. Mom left in the flesh. Then the TV delivers some exposition. Christy is going to die. Tonight. Um, who the hell is Christy? The movie never introduced half of these characters. Now that he's at school, even his teacher starts warning him about this mysterious Christy. Christy Higgins is next, Michael. I still have no idea who Christy is. Can I get a casting sheet or something? Oh, this must be Christy. Looks like it was a heavy flow day for her. At lunch, Alex reveals her big plan. I'd like you to come over to my house tonight. I want you to meet my parents. Man, this chick moves fast. They'll be married and have three kids by the end of the semester at this rate. Meanwhile, Michael's odd behavior is affecting everyone. I don't ever want to see you again. Not gonna lie, this was the best possible outcome. Dude dodged a bullet. Then the day gets worse. Oops. <laughs> Dumped and bullied by a prep in a Benetton sweatshirt. Come on, Mike, man up. Um, did his sunglasses just get smashed without making a sound? Foley work is hard. Later that night, Mike gets a phone call. It's Unibrowlix. I guess he's still trying to hit it and quit it. Clearly, Mike is going through puberty. All that testosterone is making him trash his room. I'm not crazy! I'm not crazy! He says as he jumps around destroying his bedroom. Seems legit. The only thing that can stop this tantrum is the BrainScan News Network. Plot specific news brought to you twice a day. So, after some jibber jabber, we learn that the murders he saw really happened. And Eddie Furlong is pouring milk all over his face somewhere. Then it's time for a flashback. You must warn her. You must take her out of the city before midnight. Oh yeah, Christy. I'm sure he can get her out of town in the next 15 minutes. He probably knows a shortcut. Yep, you'll definitely save her on your huffy. Probably can show her some cool tricks, too. I can't believe he's going out in public in those pajamas. He makes it to Christy's place and is greeted by the Benetton bully who's also her brother? You don't fool around with my house. You don't fuck around with me, okay? I don't know, the red eyes are cool, but you've still got the perm and the PJs. Even my niece could beat this guy up. With time running out, Mikey gets a vision of her working at the nearby hospital. Um, how is she a nurse already? She's in high school. Mikey races to find her, but the killer finds her first. Good news is she's already at the hospital, so maybe she'll live. Just as Michael's about to save the day, he's caught by Napoleon Dynamite? Dude, don't make him sick as Liger on you. Back in the lab, Christy gets the biggest vaccine in history. Goodbye, Christy. We barely knew you. I mean, seriously, who the hell was Christy again? Whoever she was, she was clearly dead on her feet. And now it looks like Mikey is next. Turns out the killer is his best friend, Mr. Magical Rose himself. I'm sure this is all gonna make sense later. With nowhere else to run, Michael leaps to safety. Let's hope he's not in pain. You know, because of the window. Mike flees right into a house establishing shot. Inside, they decide to calm him down with a shot of Tren. 
So this is how William Cap became the greatest American hero. Do you kids even remember greatest American hero? Christ, I'm old. Also, should we be juicing this kid up? He's already trashed his room. He's gonna be out of control with roid rage. Mike passes out and oh no, someone's in his room. Let's hope it's someone from wardrobe. As it turns out, it's just the bully who carries Mike to his sweet VW Jetta so they can head off in search of a chess king at the mall. As the morning comes, Michael receives a rude awakening from Christie's brother and his trusty shotgun. It's time for a bad acting showdown. I had a vision, man. That's what I tried to warn you about. I tried to help her. I don't know. The whole I had a vision that your sister was going to get sacrificed strategy is risky with a gun in your face. Let's see how it pans out. Looking for answers, Johnny Marr drags Michael to his buddy's apartment. And it looks like David Fincher's been here. John Doe must be around here somewhere. Back in our other movie, Subplot Cop shows up to tell Alex about his new eyebrow waxing service. If you happen to come across anything that you think could help me find him, would you please call me? Yes, I will. Okay, thank you. And the scene is over. Will Alex call him before the unibrow devours the rest of her face? Back in our main movie, Michael models his PJ for Christie's brother. The sexual tension is ridiculous. Look at him fondling that shotgun. And they're watching Ruben Galindo Jr.'s Cemetery of Terror. I mean, what are the odds? They might be drunk because this TV is spoiling the final act. Oh, it wasn't me. What you saw was only my body. Is this my Virgil? After getting instructions from the TV to use the dagger on the killer, our unlikely duo set out on a quest to break into Banana Republic. Then they go to Robert's house to save him before he's the next to die, but it looks bad. Is he dead? He's drunk. Eh, same, same. They try to get him out of there, but Robert adds a complication to the third act. I don't even have my fucking pants on, man. Look, it's freezing shit. While Michael goes back upstairs in search of pants, Johnny spies something shiny and walks away from the half-naked drunk guy he's been told to protect. Stay right there. Don't move, okay? <laughs> I'm sure this is fine. Or not. Man, he's never gonna get that out of the upholstery. Johnny is too busy smoking to notice his passenger is extremely dead. Well, at least until he spots the stain. No, not my rich Corinthian leather. And the freaking devil. <laughs> Johnny breaks the major rule of the film. Don't panic. I'm Johnny. I shot Johnny, but if you believe the killer was really dead, you owe me a screenwriter's credit. Don't! Ah! Michael makes a run for it, but gets stopped by the cops. Come here, Charlie Face. Um, did he just call him Toilet Face? <laughs> Looks like they've caught a case of DWD, Driving While Dead. Michael runs so fast, he basically winds up in some sort of spy movie. Check <laughs> out that dude's stash. Turns out this is Unibralix's dad, and he's like, I must stash you some questions, son. But just as Michael is about to answer, his pink eye comes back. Prepare for hilarity. Ah! <laughs> More gunshots? Holy shit, get down, Senator! With the furniture dead, Michael takes this opportunity to kidnap Alex. Man, his felonies are really piling up at this point. They flee, and it seems like a really bad idea to let him drive with his random bouts of blinding pink eye. Back at the crime scene, Michael finds the magic dagger. And Alex spots the demon. It's impressive that she can see anything with that massive eyebrow. They hightail it to a perfect place for a final showdown. It's practically Frankenstein's lab in here. But no matter where they go, Captain Howdy's only a few steps behind them. You now play with the Ouija board, Michael. This movie must have been financed by a Hasbro competitor. After some cat and mouse, they finally square off. Unfortunately, Captain Howdy has the power to throw foam rubber blocks around. Undaunted, Michael channels his inner Schwarzenegger and lures the demon into a predator trap. But unlike in Predator, Michael's trick actually works. You could say he crushed it. And if you guessed that Howdy was going to revert back to being Michael's best friend, take back that screenwriter's credit. I'm back. It's me. And since the movie still has a few minutes left, Michael falls for it. Where's Father Karras when you need him? And of course he can make Michael float now. This really is the greatest American hero. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. Weird. Felt like I was in a cinema snob video there for a second. And now it's all up to Exposition Cop and Alex to save the day. She'll probably just browbeat the demon into submission. <laughs> now that Howdy's dying, Michael takes a swan dive. Man, that's gonna wreck his tailbone. Wait, Michael's dead? Come on, cop, comfort her. I'm sorry, baby. No, not like that. I said comfort her, not hit on her. 
And with everybody except Alex and the cop dead, the movie changes film stock. If you smell a swerve ending coming, no screenwriter's credit for you. Michael is really dead. They buried him in his favorite dinosaur PJs. What a letdown. But maybe the magic rose will fix things. I know it's supposed to do something. Probably should have paid more attention. Hey, the rose came back to life. And the film stock went to shit. You got dirt in the gate. Now that Alex will be forever haunted by the guy she randomly hooked up with in high school, we bid farewell to Don't Panic. Remember when this movie was about Ouija boards? Yeah, that seems like a lifetime ago. In the pantheon of demonic possession, witch board, Elm Street ripoffs, Don't Panic is definitely a movie. It's certainly not The Exorcist, or Demons, or any of its other inspirations, but hey, it's got a grown man running around in child's dinosaur pajamas, and that has to count for something, right? But enough about that. Can Don't Panic summon up enough splatter to earn a 5 barf bag rating? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Don't Panic sorta delivers. We're treated to face stabbings, throat slitting, and a lot of blood. There's nothing here that's unforgettable, but there's just enough splatter to earn this one a 3 barf bag rating. This is a modestly sick flick. Looking for more movies about demonic possession? Then be sure to check out my review of Beyond the Door. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.